As we move into the second half of 2010, how does the American economy function differently from the way we lived just three or four years ago? That was among the topics discussed at the Aspen Ideas Festival. This year gathering draws leaders in business, economics, and politics, sponsored by the Aspen Institute and the Atlantic Magazine. My next guest spoke at the festival. Richard Florida is author of The Great Reset, How New Ways of Living and Working Drive Post-Crash Prosperity. Richard, great to have you on the program. It's great to be here. Thanks, Thanks Maria. Thanks so much for joining us. So we've had a volunteer stock market first half of the year uncertainty over government policy coming out it feels like this so-called reset as you appropriately call it is continuing well I was able to in this book look back at the two previous analogous events the Great Depression of 1929 in the 30s and then the the crash the panic and long depression of 1873 Wh what I learned in looking back is that these are not short-term processes and, and no immediate amount of even monetary policy fix or short-term stimulus is going to fix us. These are generational events. And what happens is we get major bursts of technological innovation. That's important. But then Americans go about their ways, thousands of millions of people are resetting the way we live, the way we work, and the way we consume. And that's how the reset happens, as we change our behavior. So we're looking at a reset right now. What, what state are we in in terms of recovery? How would you characterize things? And what's the historical pre you, you told me the historical precedent in terms of how you looked at today's resetting. But what does that mean in terms of practicality? How have people reset? Well, I think it's that is that family that was living out there in a you know 5,000 foot exurban mansion that's saying you know I can't endure the long commute, I can't endure those energy prices, I can't take those high house mortgage programs. I'm going to move back to a closer, more walkable neighborhood and commute by transit. It's that young person who's putting off buying a house, who's continuing to rent and save their money. Uh, I think we're moving in this country to a whole new way of living and working. Uh, hopefully forging stronger communities, but denser, more compact, more walkable areas. This doesn't happen overnight, though. It takes a long time for these changes at the individual level to amount to a reset at the social level. So it sounds like people really need to adapt to the changes going on around us. So for our viewers, what do we all need to know? I mean, this week we had the latest ISM Services Index on economic growth. You write a lot about uh, the services sector of the economy. Do people need to look at their jobs, their lives, the way they live differently? Yeah, we got to be a lot smarter and we got to take on less leverage. But I think as an economy, not only as individuals, the housing auto complex, the suburban sprawl, was a fantastic way to build an industrial economy. The more we built those houses, the more we spurred those assembly lines spinning, making cars and washing machines. We're not going to grow a knowledge and technology and high-tech and information entertainment economy by spending money on housing and autos and cars. We've got to shrink the amount we spend on those core bundles of the industrial age, invest more in our own skill development, invest more in new industries, from high-tech to entertainment to media. That's the way people are going to prosper and our economy is going to grow as a whole. What do our viewers need to do to adapt to this change? Well, I think we got to, I mean, we, we looked at all the studies. People who have their financial act together from people who don't have their financial act together. It's the people who spend too much money on two things. They overbuy housing and they overbuy cars. The spenders are the car buyers and the house buyers. The savers are the ones who buy a house or rent an apartment they can afford, spend less on transportation. So I think that's where we got to head. We got to get off this addiction to housing and cars and just spend within our means but make sure we can have a, a, a great life for us and our family. Yeah, get off the addiction of debt. Uh, and, and, and we're making a dent in that because the savings rate now apparently is back up to 4%. But, you know, we hear so much about the migration to cities, people moving to urban areas. Th this is going to change things as well. So what impact do service jobs and the quality of stability have on communities? Well, two things. One of the things we've been talking about here at Aspen is the remaking not only of the city, as, as Brooklyn and all of these urban neighborhoods, in a way, become more suburban. Uh, they attract young families from the suburbs. They upgrade the schools. But as our best suburbs, our older suburbs, are becoming more urban. They're becoming more walkable. So it's no longer that city-suburban divide. The other thing that's a big critical thing, we have 60 million Americans working in low-wage service jobs. Not the high-tech jobs, not the finance jobs, low-wage service jobs. And what we've been talking about here, we have a national effort to upgrade those minimum-wage, low-pay jobs that can't support a family. How do we do it? 
by doing the same things we did in manufacturing, getting employees engaged, continuous improvement, quality circles on those service jobs, making every retail shop, uh, every manicure parlor, hair salon, every store we go to a center of innovation and productivity and engagement, that's got to be number one on our priority list to create and make good family earning jobs for all Americans. Well, that requires a new skill set, and in some cases it requires training, so it goes back to education. Absolutely, and, and the returns to education, we've looked at the data. You know, someone in the United States who doesn't have a high school degree is facing a 15 to 20 percent unemployment rate. You know, someone with a college degree is facing a 4 or 5 percent employment rate. But we've got to upskill those low-skill jobs. And, and one of the things we want to do is challenge the administration, challenge the Obama administration. If we're going to have a job strategy for this country, high-skill jobs are going to do some of it. Certainly, we've got to protect our manufacturing jobs and grow them. Forty-five percent of Americans work in low-skill, low-pay service jobs. I told the story here. My dad started his job in a factory in 1934. He made barely what we'd call a minimum wage. It took nine family members in Newark to make a living wage. He came back from World War II. He had a good job with a high wage. He could buy a house and put his kids through school. We, can t we made manufacturing jobs good jobs. We can make low-end service jobs good jobs if we pay attention and do all the things we did to build up manufacturing jobs, engaging our people, engaging them in quality, focusing them on productivity improvement. It's going to be good for the individuals, but it's going to make our country more productive and efficient. The problem is the corporate sector is reluctant to add new jobs and put money into this because they don't understand what their cost side of the business will look like in 2011. They're afraid of high taxes. They're afraid of new expenses, health care expenses. Well, we're going we're gonna to grow about 15 million new jobs over out to about 2018, so less than a decade. About half of those jobs are going to be great jobs. There are going to be jobs in finance and management and high tech and arts and entertainment and media. They're going to be high-wage jobs. They pay on average three times what a low-wage worker makes. We're going to grow another 7.5 to 8 million low-wage jobs. It seems to me those 7.5 to 8 million low-wage jobs are where we've got to focus our effort. The other thing that's important about those jobs you know, we can offshore a lot of call center work. We can offshore some banking work. We can offshore some technology work. But the person who takes care of your kids or your aging parent, the person who cuts your hair or, you know, gives you a massage, the person who takes care of your house or your apartment or your lawn, those jobs we call them sticky. They are locationally rooted. Those jobs, it's going to be hard to offshore them if you can ever do it. So we need a national effort to make those jobs good jobs to strengthen families and communities. That's a great point, actually, really important. Let me, let me ask you about this on a global uh, basis, because the European debt crisis has really caused a lot of people to worry about, uh, you know, American investors worry about debt and their own individual stories. European Central Bank President Jean-Claude Trichet warned this week that the Eurozone's recovery will be uneven at best. So put this in context on a global perspective. How vulnerable is our American recovery to events around the world? Very. I, I think there's a growing consensus uh, that the recovery is stunted at best. And my look back at history just, you know, they talk about short-termism in quarterly process, short-termism in Amer corporate America. We have a short-term view when we think about our recovery. These resets, from what I could determine, are 20 and 30 year cycles. We have to think about this as a long-term process. No amount of monetary policy mucking around or stimulus is going to push us back to where we were. So we have to undertake investments with an eye to a long haul. And I, I think the question about unevenness, one of the things we can see is this crisis and recovery has been incredibly uneven across the world in our own country. Some places have barely felt it. Oil places, Oklahoma City, parts of Texas, Washington, D.C. with a small unemployment rate. Other places have been devastated. So if we want to build a country that can grow as a whole, we've got to focus on how uneven this crisis and recovery has been and how to support a stronger, more unified recovery in the future. So bottom line, how do we upgrade those low-wage jobs? Well, I, I think it's simple. Every person who's doing a job has the ability to innovate. Remember on our factory floors, you remember this, when we saw those workers as a liability, they were a cost, they couldn't contribute to quality, and then those Japanese companies came along and said, you know what, we view the worker. The worker is a source of continuous improvement in quality. We can have their input, put them in teams, get the supply chain involved. The best service companies across our country and the world are engaging their employees. Who's more important if you're selling shoes or selling retail goods? The person picking up a call, the person greeting a customer. We can involve them in employee engagement and innovation the same way we did on our factory floors to improve productivity, and we've got to do it now. Great. Great to have you on the program, Richard. Thanks so much. Thank you, Marie. Really important subject, and we appreciate your time. Professor Richard of Florida.